thank you again. Um, yeah, so we'll get right to it. So, so um, the plan is to, and I'll, I'll explain what all these words mean, but to start from a hypertoric variety, which is, you know, it's a finite dimensional symplectic variety and produce two, um, two very infinite spaces, the periodization and the loop space of X. Um, and, and use these two guys to study the enumerative geometry of your original variety and, and you know, the eventual goal, which I won't really get to, is to study the elliptic stable envelopes um, of this hypertoric variety. And so, um, and again, I want to emphasize that uh, this periodization and these, these loop spaces, despite being rather large, are, are actually very elementary and they have a sort of a very, um, uh, combinatorial flavor to them makes them very fun to work with. So um, I think this this talk in a way is a very, very low tech, low budget uh, um, sort of analog of uh, Sam Raskin's talk. But so the, you know, the results are completely different, uh, but um, somehow the, the sort of physics behind it is maybe not so different. Um, but this is kind of on a more combinatorial level less sophisticated. Okay, so start with a brief review of conical symplectic resolutions, which is a sort of general setting in which um, this talk makes sense. So if, um, so if you have a variety X with a algebraic symplectic form omega, um, which is almost affine in the sense that it's proper and birational over its affinization. Um, so you call it a conical symplectic resolution if there's a, a C star action on, on this guy that dilates the symplectic form and you know, contracts the affinization to a point. So you can think of it as it's like a resolution of a sort of a Poisson cone. Um, the classic examples of this are the Springer resolution and the Hilbert scheme of points on C2. Um, we'll be talking about hypertoric or toric hypercalar spaces, sorry, another uh, family of examples later. Um, so why do people care about these guys? So given, um, given sort of a degree two class on X, you can get a quantization. So this is a, a, a non-commutative algebra that quantizes the coordinate ring. Um, so it depends on this parameter and it shares a lot of features with the universal, universal developing algebra of um, you know, a semi-simple Lie algebra evaluated at some central character. So in fact, if you start with X Springer resolution, um, that's exactly what you get by quantizing and so the sort of geometric study of representations of G, um, a lot of it can be sort of expressed in terms of properties that make sense for any symplectic resolution. And then you can go and quantize other, um, other spaces like Hilbert scheme of points on C2, you get a Trednik algebra, and then you can apply sort of the same geometric intuition to that. Um, so, Specifically, we'll be interested in the following kind of representation theory. So you, you, take, um, you take a torus A acting on X, a Hamiltonian torus in the sense that it preserves this holomorphic symplectic form. Um, and you fix a co-character of the torus. Okay, so um, you could sort of think of this as a direction at infinity in the torus. And so you define category O with respect to this co-character sigma and um, this parameter eta as you know, the, the quantization modules for the eta quantization that are bounded at infinity in the sense that um, basically sort of so they have a compatible action of, of your torus A and the weight spaces die off 
as you head towards infinity in the sigma direction. Um, so this is an analog of uh, category O, one of the various flavors of category O from uh, more classical representation theory. Um, and if you pick some, some module inside this category O and you look at its, its support, meaning, you know, you, you can take the, um, you can take a filtration of it and take the associated graded chief and you get some, some coherent chief on X. Um, you'll find that that support lies inside a certain Lagrangian in X, which is a Lagrangian of directions that are, you know, sigma bounded, so they're contracted by this co-character. So I'll, I'll call that the um, ATT sub sigma for attracting sub sigma. Um, so you can think of category O as sort of quantizing various components of this singular Lagrangian. All right. So um, I'm sort of contractually obliged to mention at this point that so uh, symplectic resolutions come in pairs, called symplectic dual resolutions. Um, so uh, this was, I mean, this, this terminology, I think, was coined by uh, Braden Proudfoot Lucato Webster. Um, it, it is a sort of now understood to be a feature of sort of 3D mirror pairs of, uh, of uh, gauge theories, supersymmetric gauge theories. Uh, but I won't say anything about the physics, so we'll just treat it as kind of a mathematical black box. So the idea is you start with a symplectic resolution X and uh, a different symplectic resolution X shriek. Um, and the the first part of the sort of symplectic duality package is that the, the torus, Hamiltonian torus acting on X ends up being equal to the, um, the sort of Kähler torus, H lower two of X shriek coefficients in C star um, and, and vice versa. So, so just point of terminology. So we'll sort of call this, this guy here the this is the, um, let's say the equivariant part of X is this torus A and the Kähler part of X is this torus H lower two of X C star. Um, so the, these two tori are, are interchanged. Um, and both of these tori show up in the definition of category O. So if we go back here, we, to, to, um, to define category O, we sort of pick a, a co-character of A and eta, which you can loosely think of as a co-character of this Kähler torus. All right. And so the, maybe the most important feature of symplectic duality, um, at least for us, is that having identified these two parameter spaces, the category O's are, are um, not identified, but are causal dual to each other. Okay, so in some sense, um, this is some very loose analog of homological mirror symmetry, which is a two-dimensional phenomenon. Um, so th this generalizes the famous um, causal duality for, for category O of, uh, you know, Balance and Ginsburg and, and Zergel. Um, it's been proven in uh, many, many uh, cases. Um, so I apologize, is, I'm not going to be, uh, uh, I'm not doing due diligence as to um, reminding you who has proven what here, uh, but, uh, yeah, so, so so a lot of people have done a lot of work at this stage on symplectic duality. Uh, it's a very active topic. Okay, so a classic question you can ask is how does this causal duality or, or symplectic duality between X and X shriek interact with the um, enumerative geometry of X and X shriek? Um, so sort of the, the general scheme of this question 
I left it purposefully vague, is um, you, you write down some sort of generating function, z of x, which basically counts maps from a curve, say p1, into x um, with a fixed uh, fundamental, uh, you know, degree, so a fixed image of the fundamental cycle, beta. And there are, there are various ways of uh, defining such spaces of curves and then various ways of counting them. Usually you define some virtual fundamental class and you, you take the, the virtual count. Um, but in the end, what you get, you get some function um, z sub x, some sort of generating function. Um, and the, the question is, you know, describe this guy in terms of x shriek. And there's many um, sort of different versions of this question. Uh, so, so Aganagic and Akunkov um, have uh, sort of uh, indicated that the quantum K theories of X and X shriek are sort of symmetric. Um, there's this uh, work of uh, Bulimor, Dumofte, Hilburn, and Gayoto. Um, there's some somewhat recent work of uh, Kamnitzer, myself, and uh, Nick Proudfoot. And uh, I just noticed the other day on the archives, there's a paper of uh, Andrei Smirnov and uh, um, Zhu, I think. I should have made sure to note his name. Um, on, um, again, on this topic. OK. So, so this is going to be. Again, um, sort of a contribution in this direction, but the slightly different flavor from uh, the ones I note here. So, um, okay, so we're going to focus on hypertoric or toric hyperkähler varieties. They were introduced by Bielowski and Dancer, uh, and uh, studied some more by uh, Goto. And um, so, <laughs> as Joel mentioned, there's some controversy over what's the correct terminology for these guys. Um, I think the original name was Toric Hyperkähler. Um, uh, somehow, if you're working over a field which is not C, then you know maybe the word Hyperkähler seems a bit misleading, and then maybe you call them a hypertoric variety. Uh, I, I, I hereby proclaim myself agnostic on this question. Do I want to get on anybody's bad side? Um, so, um, but what's a, what, what is such a thing? So you start with a torus G acting on cotangent bundle of a vector space. Um, and you define a hypertoric variety to be um, symplectic reduction of this cotangent bundle by G. Okay, where we've picked some generic um, stability parameters, so GIT stability parameter theta. Um, and, and these guys are examples of uh, conical symplectic resolutions. In some sense, they're, you know, whenever you want to prove something about conical symplectic resolutions, you should start by trying to do it for hypertorics. They're the toric varieties. They are to CSRs as toric varieties are to general varieties. Um, they geometrize matroids um, in the sense that uh, given a matroid, you get, you get such a, or given a representable matroid satisfying some conditions, you get such, such a torus action um, and then properties of the matroid go over to properties of X. They abelianize quiver varieties in the sense that to each quiver variety, Nakajima quiver variety, you can associate uh, sort of hypertoric variety that captures some of its properties. And there's a nice subclass associated to graphs. So given any graph, you get a hypertoric variety, um, which is somehow like, it's especially intuitive to work with. So I, I give two examples here. This necklace with three vertices gives you the C2 mod Z3 graph and resolution. And this little, um, uh, you know, <laughs> whatever you want to call it, gives you cotangent bundle of P2. The hypertoric variety is the same dimension as twice the genus of the graph. OK. Um, so uh, uh, remind me, um, 
so I started at 11.15, so I should go on until um, 11.40, right? That's correct. Great. You could probably go to 11.45 without complaining. <laughs> I wouldn't presume to take up any more of your time. So, um, all right, so uh, this category O is, is very well studied for these hypertorics. Um, they're sort of work that kind of predates, um, let's say, the, the study, of, the general study of category for symplectic resolutions, so Mousson and Vanderberg, and, and then it was um, sort of really worked out in full gory detail um, and, and sort of defined also in uh, Braden, Licata, Proudfoot, and Webster. Um, so this was sort of the initial kind of test case for symplectic duality for these guys. And in particular, um, just combinatorial points of so the simple objects in category O are, are going to be indexed by the fixed points with respect to the torus action. Um, and uh, just as an example, when if you're in the graphical case, that's a uh, you see, um, fixed points are, are the same thing as spanning trees of your graph. So, um, so yeah, it's a sort of a nice combinatorial um, indexing of the fixed points. Okay. So moving on to some new stuff. So we're going to be interested in starting with um, hypertoric variety and producing two sort of hypertoric varieties, but, but very large ones. Uh, and we'll start with the graphical case. So here I've drawn um, a graph, gamma. Oops. Um, and if you look to your left, you see um, this, this graph that I've drawn, <laughs> it's, it's gamma again, but I've subdivided all of each edge into infinitely many segments, Z many se segments, okay? So this is, uh, you could say it's a non-finitary graph. Um, you know, it's, it's sort of locally finite in the sense that um, each vertex only has finitely many edges sticking out of it, but has infinitely many edges, infinitely many vertices. And so I'm going to call this the periodization of gamma. Um, it, uh, and the second way I could take gamma and sort of grow it into something monstrously large is to take each edge. So that's now we're on the right hand side. And um, sort of start duplicating each edge. So now I have, uh, I don't add any new vertices, but I end up with Z many copies of each of my original edges. Okay, and this thing is, is not finite type in any sense. Well, you know, each edge connects to finitely many vertices, but each, each vertex connects to infinitely many edges. I'll call this the loopification of gamma. And I, I have this notation, you know, P of gamma for the periodization and L twiddle of gamma for the loopification. Um, and, you know, if you're into, uh, planar graph duality, you note that these, these two operations are sort of planar dual to each other. So if I, if I start with a planar graph and it's dual and I, you know, periodize my graph, then I, I end up uh, loopifying the dual. Hey, Michael, a quick question. Yeah. In the graph on the left, the periodization graph, yeah. what's the, what are the black vertices connected to? <laughs> so the, the, way, the way you would sort of define this graph is by starting, uh, by, you, subdivide, you keep subdividing the middle of the edge. And so the black vertex is, um, um, you know, connected to uh, some, some red dot. Um, and then you keep sort of subdividing and subdividing in the middle. Um, so, I'll, uh, how can I say, it? if you wait just a second, I'll, um, I'll get to a slightly more, um, well, I'll get to 
the sort of hypertoric version of this, where I can say exactly what we want to do. Um, so, right, so, so the hypertoric picture is kind of analogous. So before you do, it looks like the Benjamin also has a question. Um, sorry, uh, I, I didn't get that. It looks like Benjamin Damage also has a. Ah, um, let's see. Uh, he's raising his hand here. Um, he says. Thank you. Sorry, I couldn't unmute myself. Uh, I had to have someone unmute me. That's why I was raising my hand. Um, do, the red vertices aren't uh, distinguished in this picture, right? On the left, I mean, you've drawn them so that we understand what it looks like, but in the end, are the red and black vertices on equal footing or no? Uh, geometrically, yes, they're on perfectly equal footing. Okay. Uh, thanks. Um, so um, the, the somehow like, uh, so in particular, you know, you, you might say, well, if I started from my original graph gamma maybe had four black vertices instead of three, I would get the same periodization. Um, but somehow for us, these, these will be actually different, meaningfully different. Um, even though geometrically it will be the same space, we'll be interested in different structures on them. Um, okay, so, right. So non-finitary hypertorics, um, it's just a kind of an analog of this construction for graphs. So you start with a hypertoric um, X, which is a symplectic reduction of a vector space, and you produce uh, the periodization of X and the loopification of X. And I, the periodization is a little tricky to describe I'll give you an example in a minute, but the loopification is very easy to describe. So you just take, um, you take your original vector space, you tensor with Laurent polynomials, and then there's a natural action of the sort of gauge group on this guy and you take the symplectic reduction. So it's a, it's a very, very naive version of a loop space. Um, it's actually closer to the universal cover of the loop space, as I'll say in a second. But, um, um, so the, the fixed loci, sorry, well, the, the groups acting on these guys are, are related to the groups acting on your original X, but you have some extra, extra stuff. So you have the, the torus A, as before, jacks on both sides. But on the periodization, you have an action of the co-character lattice of, um, that should be the co-character lattice of A, not the T. Um, and then on the loop side, you have an action of, um, so loop rotation, so something that scales t, uh, t to the k by q to the k, and uh, you have an action of the, the curve lattice of x, which you can think of as a sort of, um, sort of deck transformations acting on the universal cover of the loop space of X. Um, so, all right. So here's, um, here's sort of an example, this box here. So if you start with X uh, given by the cotangent bundle of P1, so this is sort of a way of picturing it, then P of X is gonna be this infinite, uh, well, it's gonna be an infinite type surface. So two dimensional surface containing this infinite chain, this sort of chain of length Z of, of P1s, uh, which you might recognize it's, uh, it's like the universal cover of the Tate curve, or it's a sort of affine Springer fiber for SL2. Um, it has many guises. On the other hand, if you take the loop space in our, in our sense of T star P1, you get T star P infinity, okay? All right, so I'm, I'm almost out of time, so I'll accelerate a little bit. Um, so we're interested 
in considering category O for these like rather large hypertorics. Um, so let's take a look at category O for the loop space. So to, to define category, we need to pick a, a co-character of our you know, acting torus. And um, so we'll, we'll pick two different co-characters, sigma plus, sigma minus. Sigma plus scales loops positively, sigma minus negatively. And if you think of what are the sort of uh, attracting sets for these co-characters, well, sigma plus is going to have a tracking set given by you know, holomorphic loops into x and sigma minus anti-holomorphic loops into x. Um, and what do you get if you take the intersection of these attracting loci? Well, you get um, a map from p1 into x. Um, if, you, if you sort of translate one of these loci by uh, beta, where beta is a curve class, so we call you have an action of h2 of x on, on the loop space, um, then you get something like, um, you know, maps from P1 into X that are allowed to be singular at, um, at some point and have class beta, okay? So, so this is sort of a hint that um, these, two, these two attracting sets have to do with quasi-maps of a given degree. Um, and just as a special case of the general theory of category O for some uh, hypertorics, the, the simples in category O for the loop space are going to be indexed by um, fixed points of x times curve classes of x. All right, so uh, let me quickly uh, state some results um, and then I'll be done. So, so the, we, together with um, Artan Shishmani and, and Shikdong Yao, we um, took a look at this category O. Um, so we picked two, two simple objects indexed by you know, a fixed point and a curve class. And so what we show is that um, the X groups of these simple objects are equal to the cohomology of some moduli space of, of twisted quasi maps of class beta. So this is a sort of precise um, realization of of this kind of uh, somewhat heuristic analogy. Um, so, you know, if you're an enumerative geometer, maybe you're, you're interested in this kind of um, object. You just want to count the, the dimensions of these guys. And we end up expressing it as an X group of these, these two symbols. And then we show that if you start with two dual hypertoric varieties, then um, these two non-finitary guys I described are actually um, symplectic dual constructions. So the, the symplectic dual of the loop space is the periodization of the symplectic dual. Okay. Um, and so unfortunately, uh, I'm sort of uh, running out of time, so I'm going to <laughs> uh, I'm gonna, gonna sort of skip past uh, this beautiful picture here. But, but very quickly, um, by applying symplectic duality to our, our, um, our loop space, we end up with some modules on the periodization. And you can show that in the end, you can show that this generating function for um, twisted quasi maps ends up being equal to a character of a tilting module on the periodization. Um, uh, this is a result kind of in the spirit of um, the works I mentioned previously, but it, in a sense, um, it, it has a very uh, hands-off flavor to it. Um, and yes, in the very last Slide, I wanted to at least mention the elliptic stable envelope. So if you want to recover elliptic stable envelopes on X, um, so this is a work in progress, but I think the, the right thing to do is to consider a different kind of co-character, now one which is trivial in the loop direction. So it doesn't rotate the loops at all. And if you take category O for this slightly degenerate co-character, um, you're looking at Lagrangians that are sort of uh, you know, contain loops with infinitely positive or negative degrees. 
And so the um, so this work in progress aims to sort of recover the elliptic stable envelopes that Aganage and Akunka have defined uh, sort of from characteristic cycles of these, these Lagrangians. All right, thanks for listening. Thank you, Michael. Uh, are there any questions? If anyone has a question, they can unmute themselves and ask the question. Uh, I, I have a kind of a, maybe stupid question. This X group between L plus and L minus, <clears throat> can they be interpreted in terms of some kind of uh, Floer theory? Um, so I think the answer to that is yes. Um, I'm so so these are these are Lagrangians inside an infinite dimensional um, hypertoric variety. Um, so they're, you know, they're infinite dimensional Lagrangians. Their intersection happens to be finite dimensional, but somehow you have to, um, um, there's some, I'm, I'm using some sleight of hand here somehow in, or, in order to apply usual results from floor theory or even from usual hypertoric theory, you kind of have to approximate them by finite dimensional guys. Um, but yeah, and in principle, this is expected to be, um, yes, homomorphisms between two Lagrangian brains inside the Fukai category of the loop space. Um, but that's not, that's not a, nobody has actually proven that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I actually have a question about that equality there, Michael. Is it, do you have a P on the left side, but no P on the right side? Is it those quasi-maps based at P or not? Yeah, they're, they're sort of based at P. That's kind of the, um, it's, it's a little, um, the, the actual sort of relation is a little bit annoying. So let me, uh, let me not try and explain it. But yes, there, there is dependence on P. Uh, um, can I ask, uh, for, uh, for non-hypertoric varieties, for more general uh, hyperkähler varieties, uh, yeah. do you know what the periodization and loop space are? I mean, is the periodization what I think it is? Like I, I look at a base of a delphine Setlin map and take a universal cover or something? Or no, that's, uh, um, I take it back. But uh, do you know what they are? Um, yeah, so good question. So like, the periodization, I, I really should have mentioned this, but it's not, we certainly didn't, uh, we're not the first pers people to study it. So I learned about it personally from um, uh, Tomas Hassel and Nick Proudfit. Um, and it's just another word for, you know, the multiplicative hypertoric variety, or really the universal cover of the multiplicative hypertoric variety. And so, yeah, you're asking like, you know, all these multiplicative analogs of other symplectic resolutions are those, the periodizations. Um, and I, I don't have anything intelligent to say about this. I mean, it, it, it would be great um, to sort of have a general, you know, picture where uh, taking the universal cover of a multiplicative symplectic resolution is causal dual to uh, taking a sort of loopy symplectic resolution. Um, and I think you can, if you sort of squint at the, um, literature on, on you know, in, around the, the Springer resolution, so more generally the study of the affine Grossmannian, affine flag variety, and so forth, um, you can find statements that, that look like that, although people don't think of them that way. Um, but I have, I have, you know, not the slightest idea whether this is actually true in any generality. So that would be super interesting to, to think about. Cool, thanks. Uh, and M Michael, you mentioned um, like the causal duality at the beginning of the talk, or toward yeah. like this BLPW causal duality. Is it related to this um, phenomenon of the exchange of the periodization and the loopification? Um, um, well, I, I guess for me, the sort of logical 
sort of order of operations in the hypertoric case is that, um, so, you know, for, for hypertorics uh, to get the symplectic dual, you apply kind of a, a combinatorial procedure. You know, you got your hypertoric by taking a quotient by a torus acting on a vector space, and you apply some, you know, Gale duality to this data and you get a new hypertoric. And the duality between uh, the periodization and the loopification is really, you, you can see it at that level. It's a duality between uh, the, uh, you know, the Gale duality between the sort of uh, matroid of the periodization and that of the, the loop, loopification. And then once you know that, you can apply the results of, uh, you know, BLPW to get a sort of a causal duality between these categories. Um, so I, maybe I misunderstood your question, but are you asking whether one can somehow like think of this in the reverse direction, like starting from the starting from the causal duality between X and X shriek somehow guess at this um, symplectic duality of the loop and the periodization? Yeah, or or vice versa, but. Um, um, yeah, I mean, uh, fundamentally, um, yeah, I don't have a, I don't have a good answer. I mean, I, I think I'm sure, uh, you know, asking some of these people who studied this from a different, uh, like, you know, like Sam Raskin, uh, did in this talk in a sort of a more, um, shall we say like a more, uh, canonical setting, um, you know, it may be possible to like deduce this from general principles, but I don't know how. Um, um, Katarina wants to ask a question. Uh, she wants to know if about the algebra structure on the X in your isomorphism um, there. Ah, yeah. So, um, so the algebra structure in, uh, sorry, so this is uh, this, this X group, right? Um, yeah. So, yeah. So on the, on the left-hand side, you have a perfectly sensible uh, ring structure. I mean, you, you know, you need to take the direct sum over all simples. And, and on the right-hand side, right, it's a little less clear why there should be an algebra structure on these guys. Um, and, you know, in, in some sense, you're, you're doing something like considering, uh, you know, Hecke modifications of quasi-maps at, at some point on your domain curve, and you get some sort of a small algebra type thing. Um, but Maybe one point I should make in this connection is that I've, I've suppressed here a difference in the gradings between these two sides. So they, they, these both have natural gradings and they're, they're not equal. They differ by some constant. Um, and uh, in fact, they differ by infinity. The gradings are off by an infinite amount. Um, so, so there's something, there's something tricky that I've sort of suppressed in this talk, which is that, you know, that, all of these equalities are kind of, um, you know, they're, they're proven by taking some limit as you approximate the loop space by larger and larger truncations. And uh, you always have to sort of renormalize this limit by taking some uh, uh, bigger and bigger shifts of the gratings. Um, but this is, you know, not unfamiliar in, uh, you know, when people study, uh, let's say, uh, sheaves on semi-infinite orbits in, in the Athan Grismani, and you also have this problem of, you know, infinite grading shifts uh, corresponding to infinite codimensional subvarieties. Or in the BFN construction. Cool. Right. right. I think Eugene has a question. Eugene, do you want to ask it? Uh, sure. So I think it's related to this truncation. So you if you have two dual planar graphs, so you can not take infinitely many copies, but instead you put n points on each edge of one of them, and you take n copies of e each edge in the dual. Yeah. So you still expect symplectic duality between these hypertorics? 
Uh, yes, in fact, that's that you can just prove that there's symplectic dual in the, um, you know, in the usual sense. So you can directly apply the results of uh, uh, the LPW, and really the sort of the what we do is essentially take this symplectic duality for these sort of finite versions and kind of take a limit as the number of points goes to infinity. Mm -hmm. And is it related? So the varieties is related to the original, like X and X dual? Um, so if you take, you know, finitely many points, let's say on the, on the left-hand side here, um, you can think of, uh, so, so maybe I can draw a little picture. So um, let me choose a different color. So, all right, so if X, were, let's say, a chain of three, um, three P1s sitting inside a, a little symplectic surface, then you could define the sort of n periodization of X to be just n copies of this chain. Uh, but you attach them in both. Uh, uh, sort of on both sides. So I'm not doing a great job here of Trying this in a legible way, but so you have n copies. Um, on the other hand, the, the loop space, so the sort of n truncated loop space of X, um, well, it's going to be some higher dimensional guy, but you can think of it as sort of like maps of, for polynomials of bounded degree into, into X. There are polynomials of bounded degree. Okay, let's thank Michael again.